which copy copies copy. What is important is not that this is all fake, for the content is irrelevant. It is the horizontal structure of the experience that is important. And that structure is one of magnifying and extending time to provide for people doomed to the shallow present of an electronic media society a substitute for a historical consciousness. You feel nostalgic for a past, and it doesn't matter if those tilted DC-3s and bogey walking away with Claude Rains and the tarmac is not really your experiential past. After all, what is experience in an electronic society? The important thing is that those images are in your memory as images of the past, for that makes them part of your experience. It's all the same past for kids for whom Humphrey Bogart playing African sailor or Chicago gangster, or Carlton Heston playing Moses God or Michelangelo, are all old folks back there in time with George Washington, the Beatles, Louis Armstrong, and Babe Ruth. If you grew up with 50 channels on your TV set or hypercard stacks in your personal computer, then the past is not a text that moves from left to right with everything dated in a linear fashion from BC to AD. For post-historic Los Angeles, as Nathaniel West pointed out long ago in his novel, The Day of the Locust, history becomes a movie set that spatializes time. On one studio lot, you have Caesar and Cleopatra, while next to it, the Sioux are defeating Custer. For the young raised on electronic media, there is no historical past. There is only an eternal present in which all time is going on now. The narrative through which you construct events into a world is not a narrative of personal history, but a pastiche of lifestyles. Lifestyles are expressed in costumes that are a patchwork of signs purchased in a boutique. Furniture for the young is not an artifact of a king, a Louis XIV, but a poster of a celebrity, a Coca-Cola waste paper basket, a mobile gas pump light, and a war surplus inflatable life raft bed. These signs, whether they are worn around as furniture or on as clothes, have a recognizable nostalgic feeling to them, but no real history. In the costume as lifestyle, you don't become your own movie, as you might have done in the generation of the Depression. You become your own music video. In the former, you have an identity that unfolds its story, but in the latter, you have a collage that flashes its momentary mood and passing style. One of the reasons our generation got so caught up in Joseph Campbell and the monomythic pattern of separation, initiation, and return is for the generation over 35, we are immigrants to this new foreign world, and we hungered for myth and structure and meaning and an identity that unfolded itself through suffering and, and purgation and final illumination. But we're on the other side of this, you know, this great divide, and, and that kind of mythic structure is precisely what the music video culture is not. So Joseph Campbell was an antique as soon as Bill Moyers canonized him. These children of Sesame Street and MTV will not grow up to become responsible citizens with a highly developed sense of civic duty, but they will express a highly magical sense of global participation in sound that allows the skin of their own bodies to become the vibrating tympanum of a new collective entity. In fact, this is precisely why the young like to have their music loud. If you go into a bar that is a body shop for the young, it is not a pub in which you can have a conversation. It is a space in which all the bodies are kneaded into shape by physically palpable, extremely loud noise. You don't go there to exchange ideas, but to drum your edge, to feel the beat and the pulse in which you become part of the scene. Like motile spirochetes that billions of years ago attached themselves to large and sluggish cells in the evolution of bacteria, this noisy critter made up out of people is a piece of connectionist architecture that is headed for forms of life we old folks can hardly imagine. A person of my generation simply cannot stand to be in these spaces for even a few moments. Just as noise in public spaces takes away the silence necessary for mature and knowledgeable reflection, so does our entire invisible environment of electronic noise from microwave to elf, extremely low frequency radiation from transmission cables, wires, and video display terminals, take away the biological autonomy of the etheric membrane of the individual. The ultimate development in this direction is not a ride in the dark in Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, 
but an immersion in the cyberspace in which one's own etheric body is pirated by the electronic noise of a full body suit immersion into virtual reality. The full body suit is a technological literalization of the esoteric subtle body or etheric body, the pranamaya kosa of yoga and Tibetan Buddhism. This envelope of the subtle body is also the point of focus in Chinese acupuncture and in the martial arts such as Kung Fu. By interfering with its functioning and by appropriating it in a literalization that imitates but degrades its es esoteric functioning, the individual is shifted away from the autonomy of its own membrane in its incarnation toward a collective incarnation. To understand this shift, one has to read cyberpunk fiction or the works of Rudolf Steiner, who predicted this state of cultural evolution and called it the emanation of Ahriman. Unfortunately, this reference to Steiner will probably upset students of cognitive science, especially my son. But they should ask themselves why practitioners of artificial life in software worlds often get the feeling that if there are worlds below them, then there could well be worlds above them, cognitive domains that exist in multidimensionality. William Gibson, the leading practitioner of cyberpunk science fiction and the writer who coined the term cyberspace, is clearly fascinated with the nature of evil as the new landscape of electronic technology. And in his novel, Count Zero, he has crossed voodoo with artificial intelligence. The cognitive scientist who is willing to take in voodoo should not be so quick to throw out Steiner. For thinkers as subtle and gifted as England's Owen Barfield, Germany's Joseph Beuys, and America's Saul Bellow have been fascinated with Steiner's philosophy. There is something to it, and if one wishes to understand the new electronic landscape that dematerializes our old worldview, then one can learn from Steiner without fear of having to roll, enroll in his anthroposophical movement. Rudolf Steiner was an intellectual mystic whose philosophical movement through the normal Weberian process of the routinization of charisma has now become a somewhat rigid and humorless cult. Therefore, one can argue that if religion ends up in deception and distances itself from the original vision, it might be more true to the spirit to begin with deception itself in the realms of art and entertainment in order to constellate a disguised congregation sharing an unconscious cosmology. In his 1940 film, Fantasia, which has recently been re-released in 1990 to celebrate its 50th birthday, Disney reintroduced the animistic cosmology in which the fairies and the elves embody the seasonal powers of nature. By constellating a congregation through fun and entertainment, Disney was also able to use his films and his public following to amass the capital needed to found his electronic polity of Disneyland and Disney World. Science fiction writers and computer game hackers have continued this evolutionary crossing of pre-industrial animism and post-industrial capitalism by reintroducing the world of sorcery and the great battle between good and evil, between black and white magic into their software. All these different types of minds have reintroduced animism because the conventional worldview of materialism is not subtle enough to deal with the complexities of a multidimensional universe in which domains interpenetrate and are infolded in one another in a non-Euclidean manner. Werner Vinge explained the fascination in his story True Names, which in 1979 was one of the first science fiction ventures into cyberspace, quoting Vinge. Mr. Slippery had often speculated just how the simple notion, notion of using high-resolution EEGs as input-output devices had caused the development of the, quote, magical world representation of data space. The Limey and Erythrina argued that sprites, reincarnation, spells, and castles were the natural tools here, more natural than the atomistic 20th century notions of data structures, programs, files, and communications protocols. It was, they argued, just more convenient for the mind to use the global ideas of magic as the tokens to manipulate the new environment." End quote. Ever since I saw Fantasia as a child of four or five, I have resisted Roman Catholicism and remained a Celtic animist at heart, and have known from the trance states I experienced from listening to classical music that the conventional religious and materialistic worldview of my society was inadequate. Over the years, the encounter with other philosophies and esoteric schools of contemplative practice such as yoga and Buddhism have given me ancient maps for the new world I had entered as a child.